explain what are the ways you can incorporate the tools into different projects. Uh, myself, the joy, I work as a developer evangelist. I primarily focus on the development technologies. Dartnet is my forte. Uh, Pandurang is a, I let yeah, Pandurang introduce himself. So, uh, I'm, a, I'm a developer evangelist too, with Microsoft. Uh, but I'm focused on uh, mostly on the client itself, on the client platform. So I'm focused on something like uh, Windows Presentation Foundation, which both of which we'll be talking a little about. I'm focused on web development also through the uh, So uh, that's basically what I do. And uh, uh, like you must have already seen uh, the, the PPT itself, we've uh, already kind of changed the uh, title slightly because we thought uh, uh, .NET and J2E intro is something that you've probably all been hearing for a long time. Uh, there is this kind of uh, story there about web services and how to build J2E and .NET web services. But we thought that uh, it might be useful for you to also see some other areas of interoperability, uh, not just uh, having two applications on two sides, just talking to through web services. So we've tried to kind of change it slightly and make it into a, a much broader uh, set of things. And hopefully, some of those will address the scenarios that you are looking at. And at any time, feel free to kind of pause us, ask us any question in more detail or uh, anything like that. So let's uh, begin today's session with a kind of a real world scenario. This is uh, not quite a freaky thing. Um, I'm sure all of us have, at some point or the other, imagined the world like this. We all want this. Your customers want this. This is what they tell you. Okay, they want something from somewhere in some other form to be sent somewhere else. That's that's pretty much a common definition of interoperability. Interoperability, if you go by you know the dictionary, it's the ability to use information from one atmosphere or one environment into another environment seamless. That's you know a one-way definition. But the moment you start applying this to real-world scenarios, things change drastically. Into something like this, you want to send a so, so that you can copy to the neighbor's scan partition. So you, your brother wants to send an email to you on your cell phone so that you can copy to your neighbor's scan partition. Now that is that is quite bizarre if we look at it from you know common sense perspective. But that's typically what customers ask us to do. They ask us things that are really very really complex and complicated, and that's where interoperability steps. So. I'm sure all of you today came into this room with the thought that okay, interoperability means web services. And, you know, the reason why we just got a you know feel of uh, the flow was as you mentioned, you know, you're consuming JP services and typically you use web services to communicate, get the data, and present it. So whenever we talk about interoperability, the thing that comes to the mind is okay, web services. That's the one thing. Web services are there. We create web services, we consume them, and that's how we we'll get the data from the JPE world into any other environment. But that's not all. Interoperability is not just web services. That's one very small or one component of interoperability. And if you look at interoperability in, well, if you just try to you know correlate this slide to the previous slide, you'll see that actually no one solution can suffice or give you a complete end-to-end -end interoperable scenario. So where do we go from? This is a slide like, if you see here, lots of things, lots of technologies, lots of different platforms. Uh, I want to take a minute on this slide and uh, actually talk about my own experience when I was working uh, uh, long back for a, a large American stock exchange. This was way before I joined Microsoft. Uh, so uh, they actually had a scenario like this. Uh, this is not their scenario. It's, uh, this is from a NSD article on interoperability. Uh, but uh, they actually had a scenario like this. So why do customers ask us all those uh, demands? Why do they make those uh, insane looking demands saying, I need this to work with that. I should get data from this place and I have this thing. Uh, it's also because organizations evolve, right? So there are various organizations. In this case, for example, 
uh, they might have been investments, uh, like you see all those pink looking things are Microsoft products, all the uh, yellowish ones are non-Microsoft other vendor products like WebSphere, Kipco and all of those things. Now there are investments that uh, uh, a company makes when uh, uh, they are acquiring technology, right? Uh, there are different people who make those decisions. Uh, these people have sometimes comfort with the technology, uh, sometimes they see a particular feature that is very, very uh, relevant to them and they kind of take those, those scenarios and design uh, their architecture. Now, th that particular, in, in, in my customer's case as well, uh, the, something like uh, WebSphere MQ was being used. Now, there is an equivalent on the Microsoft side, which is MS MQ, right? And when you're building an application, you where most of the pieces are on the .NET platform, you also want to use MS MQ if you need a message queue, uh, message queue functionality, right? But the uh, customer was not ready to go uh, to implement MS MQ. The, the customer wanted to use the existing MQ investments because there are three other applications that are totally different applications that are also using the same MQ thing and there is some amount of sharing data between these applications that needs to happen. So I'm just kind of trying to make the exact scenario that happens in enterprise where you will have multiple applications and these applications could be multiple platforms and they will, uh, as, a, as a business, you want to kind of seamlessly integrate between these applications. Now, uh, in this case, uh, clearly, uh, if you look at the text on the arrows, you would see that most of the uh, communication between various uh, things is through web services. And uh, uh, when we talk about web services in general, uh, the, the history of web services has been that Web services evolved five years back, we had uh, five, six, now seven years back, we had web services and XML as a standard that every platform uh, worked on. So we said, okay, good world, now everybody can talk seamlessly to one another. And then within two years of the web, of web services becoming popular, uh, people started saying, no, no, web services should be this way, or web services should be that way. And we went into multiple different uh, tangents, each platform uh, defining or trying to own up the uh, specifications for how a web service should look like. This eventually uh, led to uh, the web services uh, uh, consortiums being formed where multiple vendors came together, debated out things and today we are in a far better position where we have something called WS-Star. How many of you have heard of WS-Star? Okay, so uh, WS hyphen star is uh, uh, it's written as WS dash star. It's a series of interoperability standards on web services. So uh, the most common of that being WS hyphen BP, which is WS hyphen basic profile. Um, WS hyphen basic profile means that if your web service adheres to all the uh, requirements of WS hyphen basic profile, and these requirements are usually saying your data types. Uh, one of you had a question on uh, passing collections, right, between uh, uh, JWE and .NET. Now, these collections, WS hyphen basic profile would say, do not use a data type that is specific to a platform when you're defining an interface. Try and use uh, uh, strings, arrays, uh, and a whole bunch of other data types that basic profile defines saying these are the things that we should stick to, right? If you want to truly achieve interoperability. Today, uh, every platform, uh, I know the <coughs> JWE side, uh, the IBM WebSphere platform, and uh, on, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, the other Oracle platforms also support it, but I think they do. Uh, and uh, even if you look at uh, 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 the Microsoft platform, we support most of the WS, uh, all of the WS standards, actually. So, um, and most of the platform vendors support most of the technologies, which makes it much more easier today to use, to build a scenario like this. All you need to keep in mind is, before I design my system, I need to look into the WS hyphen star standards, look at which of the standards are uh, applicable to me. Basic profile is one standard. Uh, there is WS hyphen security. If you are going to pass security tokens and talk between uh, multiple web services, uh, there is WS hyphen I, which is WS hyphen interoperability, which is actually meant for interoperability between uh, multiple worlds and it defines exactly how you should 
write your services to interop. And once you've kind of decided that you're going to adhere to those standards, you then have to look at a technology platform that can uh, out of the box give you those uh, things so that you don't have to sit and actually look at these sort of schemas and all that to see if you're adhering to these standards. So, uh, the Microsoft, yeah. So, just to add to this, it's a huge <coughs> set of standards. Uh, if you search for WSI Hacky um, Star, you know, it's not just one standard, it's a set of standards around 20 25 standards interoperability, uh, security, reliability, reliable messaging, transaction, lots of standards. Yeah. It's not necessary that your application has to support each one of these to be compliant. You can choose that, okay, uh, if uh, my system is going to do transactions, it is going to support WSI hyphen transactions. Uh, if it is going to be interoperable, it's going to support WSI, WS hyphen interoperability. If it is going to be secure, it's going to support WS secure. So based on what your application is going to do and based on how open you want your application to be, you can choose one or more of these standards during your design of architecture. Yes, to just add a point there, uh, it's also depending on how your application is going to talk to other applications, right? So if you have a transaction system inside your application, and this transaction system is by no means related to any other outside system, for some reason this transaction system is very much your own application's logic and the entire transaction starts and ends at your system and you don't need any other system to ever know about this transaction. You don't have to properly use the base type of transaction, right? However, at some point, uh, if you if you're envisioning your application and you say at some point maybe there will be another application in this organization that will want to kind of maybe do a reporting on this or see all these transactions and all that, it is probably a good idea to kind of expose these as web services in the future. In which case, I build my logic and I build my components in a way that it, it kind of adheres to uh, WS transaction specifications. Right, so that at a later point, one of the steps in my transaction needs to go to a third party payment system or something like that. Uh, I can go out and come in and as long as that third party system is also WS transaction, I can run a transaction across multiple uh, platforms. That's the uh, way you need to think of it. These WSI can start standards. Right? Don't think of them as, oh, I will go back and every single command line application to uh, web application I write, I have to use WSI can start standards. It's, it's not really uh, for that. It's, it's more meant for saying, I where do I need to stick to standards so that at a later point there is no problem in dropping, in dropping, in dropping, in dropping with uh, any uh, other platform. Uh, these standards are formed by a consortium. Uh, this was a consortium that came together from multiple technology vendors. Um, I I had a slide to which I removed yesterday. Uh, I have it somewhere on my PC. I can probably bring it up later on now. That's it. Uh, which uh, actually shows the entire set of uh, organizations that went into this. At that time, when they started forming these standards, I think there were about 65 or 70 organizations. Today, I think there are more than 200 trainer organizations. Name an organization is there, right? So, everywhere from the platform providers like Microsoft, IBM, Sun, uh, BEA, Oracle, HP, everybody is together in this and everybody wants to build these standards in such a way to that interoperability. And uh, the technologies that are coming from all these vendors or platform uh, creators are in the future going to support these standards. So we'll be talking about WCF and Android from now, which is a new technology from Microsoft. Actually, yeah, that not only in future. Most yeah, of most of them do it actually. And uh, what I meant by future is, as we go forward, these standards are going to become a very integral part of any of these technologies uh, that are going to come out. So uh, if you are using any one of these technologies that supports these standards, you can be rest assured that you know these things are going to be either interoperable, secure, or support reliable messaging or transactions. So that way. Uh, as a developer, you are insulated from what's going to happen if this standard is, you know, standard changes or an evolution happens in the standard itself. You don't have to worry about it. Your coding doesn't change. The technology vendors will make sure that, you know, these things are incorporated in any of the frameworks or platforms that are supplied. Yeah, so we want to just now go to probably uh, showing you how we address adhering to the standards or building services and adhering to the standards on the Microsoft platform. So, uh, WCF is an example. Uh, uh, WCF is a part of the .NET framework 3.0. It's called Windows Communication Foundation. 
Now, uh, the reason why we have chosen this particular thing to uh, demonstrate how interoperability is being addressed by Microsoft is because uh, typically web services is the most common scenario, the most, most common way of interoperating with, between different platforms. Uh, now, just imagine, typically if you look at a JPE service, if you're consuming a JPE service on a Darknet platform as you had in the example, you will actually add a web reference, you will get the WSDL, you will get the interfaces, you will uh, call one of these interfaces, the stubs are created, the marshalling is done automatically for you. Most of the cases, 90%, 95% of the things are automated for you. You don't have to write any extra code to actually achieve this. But now let's just uh, you know take a scenario wherein this is not a standard uh, data type, it's a custom data type. Or let's take an example of a scenario wherein you know uh, communication is happening over a secure protocol or over a custom protocol, let's say binary protocol because you don't want to expose your data over HTTP or you don't want to expose your data over uh, uh, existing channel, you create your own channel to communicate with it. Now how will your application which is being created in .NET interoperate or interact or run uh, with an application that's doing this kind of you know, custom marshalling or custom channel? channel? WCF as a technology incorporates all these uh, paradigms of interoperability or interoperating. So whether it is a ASMX web service, ASMX page, whether it is a JPE service, whether it is a service that uses uh, you know, attribute-based programming, or whether it is a service that uses system messaging, or whether it is .NET remoting, or any of the uh, web service extensions uh, that support the web services protocols. So. Uh, no matter what kind of technology someone has chosen to create a service or create a component, if you are creating a client or if you are creating a server using WCF, it pretty much guarantees that as a developer you don't have to know all these technologies separately. So uh, typically if you look at a real world scenario, take an example of the bank. Uh, if a payment gateway is implemented by a bank on j uh, then you as a developer need to understand how to communicate with the j uh, web service. On the other hand, if it is a custom uh, channel, which is, let's say, using some kind of custom encryption and custom audition, uh, now as a developer, you'll have to understand that channel. So it becomes very, very specific to the application that you are trying to use. And it's very difficult for one single developer or one single team to understand all these different, you know, uh, exclusive ways of communicating. That's where WCF actually helps you. So as long as, uh, in, uh, I'll just go a step further and give you a little bit more detail here, which is actually not part of this uh, presentation, but so uh, whenever you are defining a web service using WCA, or whenever you are defining a service using WCA, we essentially have to define an endpoint. An endpoint contains three things, uh, address, binding, uh, and uh, contract. So the address is where your service is hosted. It could be on IAS, it could be on a custom, uh, web server or a custom server. Binding is essentially how you are going to communicate with the service and what data are you going to pass on to the service. And the contract is what is the service going to do. So what are the methods that are being exposed by the service. Now as long as you define these three things A, B and C, it is binding in contract. As a developer it really doesn't matter to you what's behind this. So it could be a custom channel, it could be a binary uh, marshalling, it could be uh, HTTP, it could be HTTPS, it could be TCPIP, or any other protocol for that matter. So, um, if you go into depths, you'll actually see that there are lots of protocols that are pre registered. If you, you write .NET code, okay. No. okay. Okay, sure. Right, so, uh, go on. Yeah, no problem. So uh, the whole idea of WCF is to provide you with a framework that insulates you from understanding all these different protocols, different channels, different technologies of communicating with each other. And WCF supports the web services standards. So it also guarantees that if a third party service is built using any technology, as long as it's compliant with these standards, it will be able to interoperate, it will be able to communicate with a WCF client or a WCF server. And I'm sure all of you already know how it's easy. But I haven't configured a couple of things that I did on this stuff to then host these services. So this stuff by default does not let any incoming HTTP requests and uh, stuff. So running this might not work, but I can quickly show you the concepts of uh, WCF. So uh, 
This is what uh, you have dotted. This is Visual Studio 2008. Uh, for those who are from Java world, who don't work on Visual Studio, sorry. Because uh, I saw a lot of people working here on .NET, .NET needs to just see how you create it on this end. Uh, so this is uh, what it is. Uh, we, can, we have already targeted in Visual Studio 2008, which kind of uh, lets you either choose the .NET 2 application, .NET 3, or .NET 3 application. Now uh, I'm just choosing .NET 2.5 and saying I want to create a WCF application. Uh, so create a WCF application it should just take a second and create a bunch of files. Now by default, what you see is uh, uh, a service, i service onecs and service onecs So when my, it's created a default service for me, which is called a service one. Uh, obviously, I can delete this and start creating my real service. Uh, and it has a file called i service one. Now i service one is really uh, a contract. It is more an interface. It's just an interface uh, definition. So it's like any other standard interface that you might have seen. Uh, so forget these uh, operands that are within this square bracket for setting. And you will see that it's just an interface that says there's a string and there's a composite type. Right? And there are these two kind of uh, methods that this interface is defined. Now putting this square bracket of operations for the sake this is an operation contract means that these are operations that I want to expose as a service. Later on, when I expose this as a service, I want these two to be my operations. Uh, putting this service contract tag here says that this particular interface defines uh, the operation uh, for a service. Similarly, if you have your own data, like the composite type is a custom data type over here, uh, you can actually have a class, this is a custom class, so you can say this is a data contract and a composite type consists of a data member which is a boolean, a data member which is a string. Look at how I'm taking a composite type, <coughs> breaking it, which is a class, breaking it into standard method, standard members which are of standard types like boolean and string, and taking these and exposing them and, and, and I'm putting these uh, things around that same data member, which will tell my web service that this is this class just contains this boolean and the string. So just package these two into an XML thing and just name that XML tag as a uh, composite type slash composite type, which has uh, boolean pool value slash pool value and string value slash string value, which contains the values. So this is the way I write it in code, and my uh, SOAP classes and my uh, SOAP interface will automatically be generated. Uh, just to add one more thing here, uh, I mentioned something about ABC, the contract part, the C part, which is the contract. So if you uh, see here, the service contract and the data contract are actually the contracts that a service needs to define to be available uh, for anybody else. So that's the contract part. You define the service contract and you define the data contract, how and what it's going to be. Okay. Similarly, address is very simple. So whenever you host a web service uh, anywhere or a service anywhere, you'll have an address for that. It could be a port, it could be a HTTP address. And binding essentially means how the data is going to be transferred. Are you going to use custom channel? Are you going to use HTTP, are you going to use TCP or any of the available channels that are there? So all this information, uh, you may want to show the configuration file also. So that you have. Yeah, so the configuration file will Alright, so uh, this is the service. This is the actual service that's going through that. This is the actual implementation of the method. So there are two parts now that we saw. There's an interface, right, which is very defined. What your service is, what its members are. No implementation details. No, no, nothing about what the service actually does. The logic is not there. Just the interface is defined. Now there's a service which uh, implements that interface. So it's the standard class implementation of the interface. Which where you kind of uh, go in and uh, say this is the method, this is one method, and this is the other method. This is the actual implementation code. This and this part over here are the actual implementation code that you've written, right? Now uh, this is just the service. Now where have you said whether this is the service is a web service, or this is this is using a custom protocol, or whether it is using a WS star? But basic profile binding or security binding, none of that comes in your implementation code. Right? You just write your implementation and you have a configuration file for this particular thing. So, this is a standard XML configuration file. Uh, and the configuration file says 
Here's a service. This is the name of the service. This is the base address of the service. So this is the address where the service will be hosted. Uh, the moment I say run. And Vijay uh, was talking about an endpoint. I was saying this is the endpoint. The address is not needed here because I already used a base address. The binding it says is a WS HTTP binding which says follow WS HTTP uh, a web service over HTTP binding. And there's a whole set of default bindings that come up with uh, Windows Communication Foundation. You can also define your own uh, your own uh, bindings. And uh, then there is a contract over here that says this is the contract that defines what the service contains and what it has. So, so a good part of this thing is if today uh, you are communicating using HTTP and tomorrow you want to actually change and make it run over TCP or some other protocol that's already available, you just have to make a change here. And the WCF framework or the WCF runtime will automatically figure out how the marshal needs to be done and how the stuff needs to be created. So that's that's actually the most important part of uh, WCF. As a developer, you really don't have to go into the intricacies of each of these channels or each of these communication protocols that may be running on the same platform or for that matter on different platforms like J2E or something else for that matter. So it's not running because I haven't configured the other parts of this that I need to uh, make this run. I was not planning, we were not planning yeah, we, we didn't plan. a bunch of other uh, In case if anybody is interested, I can show it on my machine, this stuff runs on my machine, so post the session. So this is for example another endpoint <coughs> here. Uh, this endpoint is an internal WCF endpoint that says there's metadata about the service. So you must have hit a HTTP local -local slash your service or the SMS and you usually see all the information about the service. To, to expose that information, this service needs to have another endpoint. So you're taking one service, you have one endpoint which is to call the service, another endpoint for uh, accessing information or metadata about the service which is the uh, MEX HTTP binding stands for metadata exchange HTTP binding. Tomorrow, if you want to take the same service, keep these existing channels to your existing clients, add a new channel, that's a TCP binding, go ahead and add a, just add a line here that says new endpoint, it adds a TCP binding. Tomorrow, you want to stop giving HTTP access to the service, knock this line off, and the HTTP service is gone. So that's the way uh, WCF works, and that's this is what uh, we are trying to show in this particular slide where you actually see that you don't have to worry about the actual implementation whether it's ASNX or enterprise services or content remoting you write your service and then in the configuration file you define what your endpoints are and based on your endpoint it kind of just uh, exposes that particular data right. So uh, I, I hope for uh, like the concepts of WCF are uh, clear. Like you at least understand how WCF can enable the interoperability between different platforms, different kinds of uh, services, or different kinds of things. But how many of you have done COM plus or DCOM programming, or you know just had a chance to uh, work on? So typically, if you have a DCOM service today running on you know a remote machine, and you want to now expose it for a application that's going to run on let's say Java. Up till now, uh, if you don't think about WCF, the only way to that would have been to do a remote method invocation. You would have to use RMI calls or you would have to uh, write a custom application that would connect to that port, send the messages, get the result from there, unmarshal or demangle this information and then use it in your application. The good, good part of WCF is now you can encapsulate a DCOM service or a DCOM component on top of WCF. And WCF will provide a seamless communication protocol or a communication channel to any of the clients. The client could be a .NET client, it could be a JWA client for that matter. It really doesn't matter. Because now the data is going to be exposed in a standard form that's uh, compliant with the health services standard. So that's where you know the interesting scenarios of WCF come into the picture. Okay. And we are still talking about web services of them, right? I haven't told you anything new, anything different from web services. WCF is essentially a new way to write web services. But interoperability, as we mentioned in the beginning, doesn't stop here. What else do we have for interoperability? What is interoperability? Right. So we have 
couple of slides with a whole bunch of different other scenarios for entropy. So this is uh, the first three set of scenarios. Uh, Microsoft.com slash entrop, uh, URL that I also leave towards the end. Uh, if you go there, you'll actually see this whole different view of interoperability and that's what we try to kind of put in the next two slides. After which we'll show you a whole bunch of demos on these things, uh, staying with the of web services and showing other kinds of interoperability that Microsoft works on. So uh, clearly the first one is something that we've been talking about till now, which is uh, uh, interoperability between server-server scenarios or client-server scenarios, right? Or client client scenarios. So any kind of interoperability, two different worlds, web services uh, kind of sit right there. WCF shows you a better way of working with web services where you don't have to worry about uh, having a service that just exposes itself as a web service uh, and tomorrow you want to do some other kind of implementation, just a configuration file. The, uh, uh, the other kind of interoperability is what I there said at the beginning, uh, which was uh, have rich clients. Now, uh, how many of you develop applications that are consumed on platforms other than Windows? One, two. <coughs> the end client is using something other than Windows. There are a couple of people developing applications that are used on uh, other platforms. Just curious, which platform? Solaris. Solaris, okay. That's where you host your application, right? Uh, but where is it getting consumed by? Uh, Venture in Linux. Linux, okay. Uh, and uh, the other gentleman that is Linux. 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 Your client is Linux. Your client is Linux. So, uh, okay. Thanks. Maybe a whole sort of web browser sort of mostly that. Totally, yeah. So, uh, it is either a, so it's either a smart client or, or, a, or a thick client or it is a web browser, right? Uh, and if it's a web browser, you need interoperability again among multiple browsers and you need uh, interoperability across multiple platforms. Windows and Mac be uh, the the greater share of uh, consumer operating system platforms. And uh, uh, of course there is uh, uh, Windows where you might also want to build Windows applications, full-fledged Windows applications as uh, front ends to your backend end JPE applications. Now that's uh, another uh, scenario where you can do a lot of interoperability. So all the client technologies that we work with, Windows Presentation Foundation, which is a rich client technology, uh, Silverlight, which is uh, a browser-based plugin to re really develop rich internet applications, are two scenarios where you can have a really rich front-end, really, really rich front-end uh, presentation layer for middleware and uh, data layer and all that staying in J2E. Uh, another kind of uh, synergy that we do uh, with uh, uh, in, in interoperability is working with uh, third parties or working with other companies, right? Uh, an example of that is the Mono and Moonlight project. How many of you have heard of Mono? Moonlight? A couple of you have heard of it. So Mono is really an implementation of .NET. A full uh, implementation of .NET runs almost 80% of all .NET 2.0 code on Linux. Right? Mono is a full open source project that Novel maintains and runs. Uh, and uh, uh, it's at www.mono-project.com. Uh, Monoproject.com. Just search for Mono Project on the net. Yeah, just search for Mono and you'll uh, easily get to there, right? And this is a really a synergy between Novel and Microsoft, where Novel is actually building Mono and Novel is also building this uh, port of Silverlight called Moonlight. Uh, it helps Novel uh, to look at uh, the SUSE Linux and other uh, Linux operating systems that are out there and say that <coughs> users of those. Uh, operating systems can also view or run .NET applications on the client or view Silverlight based applications that have been developed. It's good for Microsoft because uh, if not, we talk, the Silverlight applications not only run on Windows and Mac, where Microsoft develops the plugin, it also runs on Linux and uh, it's Novel that's developing the plugin and maintaining the plugin over there. So we are actually working with Novel where uh, we have been giving technology uh, help and uh, giving some bits of uh, various uh, uh, codecs and things like that that they will need to implement uh, the Moonlight and uh, Mono projects. So that's another area of uh, interoperability that Microsoft does with uh, other third parties. 
And before I, you know, even touch on any of these things, there's one more thing about Chrome that you need to remember. So if you have a .NET assembly or a .NET application that's being compiled on a Windows platform, if you take it onto a Linux machine which has the Mono framework, it is expected to run as it is. So typically, a lot of people actually, when we go out there, ask us, okay, uh, you know, you say that write anywhere, uh, write once and run anywhere. Although we don't claim it. In our understanding, portability is a different uh, uh, paradigm. But uh, Mono is a classic <coughs> example of how you can take a .NET assembly and run it on a Linux machine without recompiling. Uh, the aim of Mono project is to actually enable the scenario. It's almost like 80% compatible with .NET 2.0. It still doesn't support .NET 3.0 or 3.5, but the Microsoft is explicitly helping them to build it up. So in the near future, you can expect more uh, functionality available on the Mono project. Now, having said that, interoperability is not only about uh, two different platforms or two different environments. You have to invariably interoperate between two different kinds of applications on the same environment also. Uh, let's suppose you know, your company has a huge investment in com, or your company did a huge investment in Win32, and now the world is changing. It's much easier to write applications in .NET. .NET programmers are easier to find, .NET programmers are easier to train, .NET is not as complex and as unproductive as C++ or other languages. So what do you do now? Do you throw away all that you had created earlier and start uh, building all that from scratch in .NET? Or do you somehow try and uh, leverage on these investments? So that's exactly another scenario of interoperability. How does Microsoft enable this kind of interoperability? So if you have uh, ever got a chance to do this kind of stuff, you would have realized that you, know, you go into a project and do an add reference and go to the com tab and add a com deal to your project. It creates the entire code that's needed to marshal from .NET to com automatically without you having to write in this code. What's this? This is an example, a classic example of interoperability with com. Uh, have, now let's suppose you have a Win32 deal that was created, let's say, sometime in the late 90s or the late 80s, and you want to leverage that investment. It's a wonderful DLL, it does a lot of good functionality, is optimal. But you don't have programmers who can use that as it is. You have C sharp developers who can uh, write C sharp. How do you make them use it or how do you enable them to use this kind of legacy? P invoke or platform invoke is the technology. So DLL import is an attribute that's provided by C sharp. You just add that attribute, add the DLL, uh, define the signature, and there you go. You can start calling functions or methods that are available in this Win32 DLL, right, from inside your c -sharp. So that, that's, again, a classic example of how you can leverage. Yeah, yeah and that might sound like a would want to do it kind of scenario. Uh, believe me, I've gone through it at least five times in life. Oh, where there has been some logic that has been written by a programmer a long ago. Programmers left, and that logic, nobody knows to rewrite, nobody understands, nobody knows anything about it but they want to use it. That is a critical piece of logic in the application. Nobody knows how to re uh, rewrite that thing. Platform and book has helped all the correct times. Okay, and uh, another example. Uh, what is the .NET framework? .NET framework is a managed set of APIs on top of the core framework or the core operating system. Uh, what if the .NET framework does not expose a core API of the operating system? How do you call that API from c -sharp or from VP .NET? Platform and is again the technology. So if you want to call a function from user32.dll, it's not available, let's say, in uh, the managed code, you'll have to, there's no other way to go about this, apart from using uh, DLL import or platform import. So that's again a way of interoperating with the uh, existing code or uh, legacy. Information exchange, uh, exchange. You mentioned a scenario where you want to use information that's available in Outlook or Exchange on a J2E machine or from a different platform. Now, uh, up till now, the only mechanism uh, available was write a component or write something on the .NET platform that will decompose or use the COM uh, interface of Word or Office, decompose this document, put this information in a, a string form or some exchangeable form and transfer it to j where you will again reconstruct it. Now with OpenXML, the whole uh, Office format or the Office document format is exposed as a XML-based format, which is uh, which you can you know practically traverse or uh, dissect without any 
uh, without the need of uh, installing Word or any form uh, interoperable assemblies. What's the advantage? So let's, uh, we actually be showing this scenario in a little bit uh, as a demo. The advantage here is you take a open XML document which is created let's say on Word, on Word in Windows and just transfer it to a jQuery machine and write code that will dissect or extract information from there preserving all the formatting and all the information that's available in Word. So you know information exchange or exchange between two different platforms is enabled uh, tremendously using OpenXML. So what is the format change? Like the okay, so this is a published standard. It's published. It's ISO standard now. Uh, Microsoft does not. Microsoft proposed that standard, and it has been accepted by ISO as an international standard. So Microsoft cannot change that standard anymore. Microsoft can propose changes, but it will have to be approved by the ISO committee to uh, be uh, certified as a change. It is also an ECMO standard, so it is a fairly acceptable standard as per the uh, yeah. uh, language interoperability. Now, uh, again, we have a demo on this. The classical example of uh, the CLR or the .NET runtime is that you can write code in any language that you know and still use it from any other language. So uh, all of you must have come across a scenario when you added some libraries, uh, assemblies. You don't even care about what language was uh, used to write that code. That's the advantage of interoperability between languages when we think about <coughs> .NET. We'll also talk about dynamic language runtime in a while and uh, show you a couple of things on that also. Uh, finally, open specifications. Most of these technologies that we are talking about or have talked about are based on specifications that are openly available. So why do we have almost 100 plus languages available on the .NET platform? It's not because Microsoft built those languages. It's because the .NET platform or the .NET framework is based on open standards that are easily accessible for anybody. So if you, let's say, are a language compiler shop and you have your own language and you want to write a .NET compiler for that, all you have to do is go to the ICMA website, download the CLS specification and create your compiler such that it emits code compliant to the CLS specification. That's it. That code will be uh, able to run on the .NET platform. Projects like uh, I am Python, I am Ruby, which are Python and Ruby on uh, .NET actually leverage uh, common language specifications. Look at that. They still maintain Ruby naming conventions or Python naming conventions, but they compile those. And we can show you a demo of how to use and Python. Any Python coders here? Ruby coders? Ruby coders? Just like that demo, we can skip that demo. Okay. Cool. okay. I was just wondering that, you know, all the people uh, are basically talk, talking about it. So, okay, let's get going with the demos. The first is the office interoperability or the open XML interoperability that uh, we talked about. And I'll be showing you how we can actually use uh, open XML to exchange information from a Java machine uh, onto a uh, .NET machine or a Windows machine. So if you look at this, Typically what's going to happen is you have a desktop, which is a Windows desktop. That's how you know common scenarios are. Most of the clients would be Windows clients. You generate a document on the Windows, you send it to a server that's running on Linux. The Linux server it can be having all sorts of things that it wants. Uh, you make changes there or you do some modifications or some application runs to uh, do some changes there. You download the document again, you make some changes uh, here on the client side, you publish it. And finally, you view it in the browser on the uh, client side. So this, this is a very, very common scenario. And most of the times, this is what you will see. You, As you mentioned earlier, you have a backend server that's running on jQuery, and your clients are typically uh, Windows clients. They would create a document in Word. They would send this document to the server. Now, how do you process this document? If you look at today's scenario, the only way to process this document would have been to install a third party library that would dissect or provide a common interface to Word on jQuery and then dissect information from this and feed it into your database or something of that sort. Now let's look at so we have a demo here that's been uh, you know, this is a very complex environment. We have a jQuery server in the background and we have uh, Windows plans on the front end. So here we have a JT server that's uh, uh, 
uh, running Apache over Linux, and we have some. That's the, that's the actually the uh, configuration. Right, so the configuration of the machine was listed there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a sample document, you know, some text which is created, uh, pre cooked uh, text, and I'm going to generate a Word document out of this. So, how is this Word document actually getting generated? Using OpenXML APIs. So, this is a set of APIs that can be called from any language or any application, and you can create a Word structure, a Word document, which is saved as a .x file. So, if you look at the extension there, it's docx, which means it is an OpenXML document. Any language which Microsoft standards? Not really. We actually have uh, Java uh, libraries for OpenXML also. So OpenXML, as I mentioned, it's an open standard. Anybody can actually, you don't even need a library for that matter. It's an XML file. You open up the XML file, it follows a structure. So as long as you have an XML password, you can process information from there. People have built libraries on top of it to make it much easier. Microsoft has its own version for Windows uh, platform. There is an open source Java implementation or a JPE implementation for that on Java also. Yeah, so, so basically you can make it in Notepad, but uh, the idea is that you can take a notepad and just create all those external files and package them the right way, but obviously it's complex because there's a lot of tags and stuff. So there are libraries to help you with that, and these libraries are available today, both for J2G and for .NET. And when, when, whenever we think about OpenXML, there's one important thing uh, to remember. It supports the complete word functionality. So track, uh, change tracking, history management, you know, formatting, all those things, tables, charts, uh, embedded objects. Things like that. Complex documents, complex Word documents, Excel sheets, or PowerPoint presentations can actually be processed very easily on any environment. Okay. So now, so this is a you know a sample document, a Word document that has been created and it's currently uh, open on the client side. Uh, nothing fancy here. Let me just you know make some changes here. Let's just say then. And let me add some notes here. So let's do some changes. Let's go ahead. Okay, let me upload this document. Right here. So now, if you look at it, now this document has actually been uploaded to a server that's on the jQuery platform, and you actually get that it's in the open XML format here. Let's look at the properties of the document. So you have some properties; it tells you whatever the uh, number of pages and all those things are there. So how, how did this? Uh, how did these properties come into the browser? They were actually read by the application that's running on the JPE server using the OpenXML libraries of the OpenXML format. Okay. So these were the changes that we made in that document. Let's this is the best part because here you see the browser that's actually showing the entire Word document. Right now, this particular there is no browser control or something that's running here that's displaying a docx file. It's actually the J2E application <coughs> walking through the file, understanding all the formatting. There's a very complex XSLT that is developed here, which takes uh, the uh, XML and converts that to HTML. And this is just plain HTML data being read from the uh, Word document. Now, to develop a complex XSLT would have been difficult. That's what. That's why you would use one of those ready kits that's available to uh, work this uh, with uh, J2E or with .NET. Right. Okay, you can. This is in this scenario. He, they've decided to kind of display Word document contents on the browser. So yeah, you'll have to convert that. Uh, you'll have to. It is XML text processing eventually, right? So it's text processing. Take it and convert that to HTML tags and put it there. Uh, not every scenario will have to do this because not every scenario will have to convert Word XML into uh, uh, HTML, right? So in many scenarios, it will just be a document library where you go and click and download the document. Okay. Uh, 
So imagine reports and stuff like that being generated. From your database, you get data and generate an entire Word document and put it out there. Your end clients, most likely, if you're generating Office documents, it's because your end clients have Microsoft Office installed, right? So most likely, you just kind of click on that and download the document and open the report on the clients. Is it the <laughs> it's not essential that you have to do the HTML conversion always. So we are uh, demonstrating a consumer uh, scenario or a user based scenario. When somebody uploaded a document, a Word document, and now he wants to view it in a browser. So that's where that's why we are converting this into an HTML uh, document. But in most of the scenarios, or let's say a business environment, you would be uh, uploading tens of documents. Or let's say a user enters his information in five different documents approach it on the server. Now the server has to create one consolidated document out of these four or five documents and send it back, back to the user. So he can just send it back in a docx format or a document format. He doesn't have to really convert it into HTML. This particular scenario, we are doing the conversion because that's what we want to demonstrate. The whole concept or the whole idea about demonstrating this is, in spite of the fact that this is a HTML document, it has been rendered inside the browser, you are able to get information about the changes that happened in the world up. So think about it, you know, whether if you had to do something of this kind today, what were the choices you have? Even if you can convert a document into HTML document, you would lose that change tracking or the history uh, information that's available today. Can you rename the Office with XML and open? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. 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 You can get the data actually right in XML format. Yeah. If you read in the file, .xml. Yeah, exactly. You to exactly. I, you want to see that? Okay. So I'll actually do that. So the uh, so deep for them. Yeah. Let me take. Uh, oh, this oh. So uh, let me just create a folder here saying. So uh, let me just create a new Microsoft Office Word document, right? Uh, and uh, say test our topics. I'll click test our topics. Reduce this to convert. Yeah, uh, a quick, easy way of putting random text in Word is this. Uh, so put this, do some formatting, right? Do some other formatting. Save this, close this. This is a docx file, right? Now, if I try to just rename this docx file to save it, okay, it works. And I double click that, it actually shows me all the XML units. This is how any docx or PPTX, XLX, which is the Excel uh, is, right? And if I were to now uh, open Notepad, And uh, view one of these documents, say styles. You would see that there are these various styles, TOC1, TOC2, etc., put in here. Uh, maybe, uh, it. So the, the idea is like it is regular XML. The reason why we zip it is to conserve. Space and so uh, it's a whole stuff. set of XML files. It's a whole set. Of, it's a complex structure of XML files which are interrelated to each other. So if, if you don't have any library, if you don't want to use any external tools, it is regular XML parser. You can just write an XML parser that would understand this format and, and, and these stacks that are here, this W colon and slash W colon uh, all these stacks are part of the open specification for open XML, which you can just kind of. Uh, find today on the internet and just start using right away. So you can just go through the entire specification, there's a whole bunch of tags. And if you don't want to go through the whole bunch of tags, then you download one of those uh, J2E library or uh, the .NET library for OpenXML. And you just take that and uh, work with that. So you get the same result if I go from the right? Since it's an open. Yes. yes. So it's, an it's, it's text. Once you've got text, you generate HTML or you generate anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, so 
basically you understand that's a longer demo, but the whole concept is you can actually generate a document on a Windows client and process it on a J2E uh, machine or J2E. Uh, okay, uh, the second thing that we wanted to demonstrate is language interoperability. So we'll demonstrate dynamic language runtime uh, using Iron Python. Yeah. Well, it brings that up, I can quickly talk about uh, the dynamic language runtime. The dynamic language runtime is basically uh, dynamic languages like Python, Ruby, today, uh, JScript, these are languages that we built on top of the CLR. Right? CLR is the common language runtime, which is the core of .NET. Now, .NET by default, like uh, Java, is, uh, any .NET language has to be strongly typed. Right? You need to define all your types well in advance. So, as dynamic languages do their type definition at runtime, do a whole bunch of things at runtime. Right? As it executes, each line executes, it might just change its behavior and do a bunch of things. The way we built this is by actually taking dynamic language runtime and whatever you type and execute on the dynamic language runtime gets converted to statically typed <coughs> references inside uh, the CLR. So it's pretty complex that this dynamic language runtime sitting in between is actually taking dynamic languages and making it run. And what he's going to show you is, uh, this is the Python console, the IS Python console. Uh, so this is dynamic languages that can really do, don't worry about uh, integer limits or any of that, he said uh, 33 to the power of 33 and there it goes showing you a long number and says, yeah, I, can, I mean it's no big deal for Python to do that, right? So what uh, uh, Vichar is doing now is uh, actually using a wrapper for uh, okay, I'm just, I'm wrapper right. for uh, uh, WPF, Windows Presentation Foundation, uh, which can do some really rich rendering of Windows and do a bunch of things. So in Python code, he's saying from Avalon import, import star, so it kind of takes that library that has been created so that I don't have to write a whole bunch of uh, import statements to import all the necessary classes. He's then instantiating a window saying w equal to window and saying w dot show. So the beauty of this is, this is a command line interpreter. I am writing in I am Python code, which is a dynamic language code on a command line, and I'm able to consume the uh, WPF libraries from within Python Python and create a window uh, that otherwise would uh, have worked or run only on a .NET machine using a .NET framework. It's still running using .NET framework. Yeah. Uh, it's only that Python is the interface now to code with it. So now he's creating a big equal to button which, uh, which would uh, instantiate a button type and it's giving a constructor uh, passing a uh, property in the constructor which sets buttons uh, content property as Kigli and he's taking the windows content and setting the button so that must have put the button on the window. So here is a so button. Here. button WPF by default takes any control and stretches it out. So let me just also change the font to make it bigger. So that uh, you should also probably change the width and P dot width. Yeah. But we can uh, there are lots of properties that we can actually define here. Let me uh, do a event handler. This is a Python function. Yeah. So uh, now he's writing a Python function, uh, and he's going to uh, define this. Okay. And so now there's so a function called do it. B dot and click. he's wiring that up to the B dot click, right? So that button that has already been created. Now the beauty here is that the entire button and window got created dynamically as as he was executing every line of code. Uh, there is that application changing its behavior and doing things, and then it crashes to go. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think you should, you should try to the code in this part. Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the things with dynamic languages is that only when you run that piece of code. It will actually do rigid compilation of that and run that. So, runtime alerts are uh, much more uh, uh, possible over there. Okay. So, uh, that's basically the concept of this is IAM Python today downloadable with full source code. Uh, there's also IAM Ruby, which is downloadable with full source code. So, just go and search for IAM Python or IAM Ruby. You'll get to the uh, uh, places where we put this. It's portalx.com slash IAM Python. And uh, uh, Ruby is at ruby.sourceforce.net. Uh, and you can actually kind of go and uh, download the entire source code also of these implementations of languages on Java. Okay, um, I'll give it to Pandu to demonstrate PHP. 
around five minutes, I think. Okay, so I'll have to be really quick on this. Uh, one of the things we also wanted to talk about was uh, interoperability between uh, uh, interoperability on the Windows platform that we're building on uh, hosting PHP. How many of you are interested in PHP applications or write PHP applications? Okay, two or three of you. Maybe I should, in the interest of time, I see people coming to the next session. So I'll, I can probably do this later for you. Uh, in a big gist, what I was going to show you was uh, uh, showing you this, which in IS 7, uh, which is our latest uh, uh, web server, uh, we've actually worked with Zen Technologies, the creators of PHP, to in introduce something called a fast CGI model. Historically, PHP used to run very slow on Windows, if you hosted PHP applications on Windows. We've done a whole ton of improvements there by uh, going to Zen Technologies, the creators of PHP Zen and taking uh, the fast CGI module, uh, which actually runs by doing a whole thread pool kind of thing in PHP. So uh, it actually does not instantiate a process each time. Actually, CGI used to instantiate a process each time you ran a PHP application. Uh, the fast CGI thing actually takes a thread pool and runs PHP applications by taking a free thread from the thread pool. And uh, it makes it much, much faster to run uh, PHP applications. The good thing is you can also take benefit of other IIS features like output caching where content is cached for uh, any static content that you is cached and stuff. Uh, for PHP applications, not just ASP output applications. So I'll quickly move to the last part, uh, which is uh, uh, really about rich user experiences and how you can really build rich user experiences for your existing JTB applications. Uh, so I want to quickly show a bunch of uh, uh, sample scenarios uh, you would uh, actually be able to build really rich applications, such as this one. This is something we built for box movies a while ago. Uh, this is actually a high definition movie that's playing within the browser. So this is browser independent, uh, platform independent, can even run on the mobile devices in the future. And this is a player where there's a whole bunch of new functionality. Putting video on web pages would have been a big challenge earlier. Here, not only have we put videos, we can actually overlay them with content, switch between various pieces of content so that I can go back to a particular part of uh, uh, the content and just skip through various content. Uh, even skip to a totally different movie if I wanted to and look at Die Hard or something like that. So this is one of the scenarios that you can start using today uh, by taking any of your GTV applications. Uh, as you see, this is running on an HTML file, so it doesn't really matter if this is a JSP file and add some JSP functionality around it or uh, any of that. Uh, the other kind of scenarios are non-media scenarios where you want to really build a rich uh, uh, UI for a business kind of scenario. Right? So uh, how many of you that online ticket booking? A whole bunch. Of and what is the UI that you usually see when you go to an online booking site? Drop downs, calendar controls, choose a bunch of places. Uh, what if you were to do, uh, make it a little more easier for the user uh, and build something much richer, uh, something like this? Now, all the data for this is still coming from your backend services. Silverlight has libraries that can call back web services and do a whole bunch of things. Uh, but the front end looks completely different. So now, uh, this is also running on an HTML file calling backend services, uh, in this case, which is an ASP backend service, it would be a JWD service. Uh, and if I wanted to kind of go from one place to another place, I would just kind of click on this, move to another, another location, right? So it's much easier than looking through a combo box and trying to look for a particular place. I want to select a bunch of dates, I can just go there and select a bunch of dates. And based on the dates I selected, I get various results, going, uh, making a service call back and making a text style call and getting it back. Uh, and then when I move my mouse on each of these, you would actually see this uh, little animation that's playing, because Silverlight also supports uh, animations. Uh, you could also kind of build little animations that clearly tells the user that this is one of the stupid options to take. But it's going to two different places before you reach your destination. Uh, this is probably uh, worse. Oh, this is totally out of question. This is okay. This is the, looks like the best option. Direct flight, a little later in the day, starts around 10 a.m. So uh, it's a it's a much easier option to choose. 
So this is really uh, one of my favorite samples because it really explains what a rich internet application is and how no matter what backend you're using, the frontend can really be appealing to your user and provide some great user experience. Uh, one final scenario on uh, uh, something that we're building in Silverlight uh, 2 uh, is uh, a technology called DeepSoup, uh, which lets you actually take really uh, really high resolution imaging, uh, say high resolution photographs that you've taken from a good digital camera, say 4 megapixel, 8 megapixel, 10 megapixel. Putting these kind of uh, uh, photographs on the internet is difficult, right? And this really is a, a, a technology that lets you, uh, that gives you the entire uh, way of slicing and dicing these <coughs> images, putting them on any server, it could be a JDB backend, it could be anything. You could wire it, wire it up with uh, JPE services and provide some input, interesting uh, thing. In this case, for example, uh, this is a little ad for a car. Uh, and if you wanted to go into the details, for example, if I told you that this car uh, has six gears and uh, can do a whole a bunch of speed, uh, you can, uh, you'll probably not believe me by just looking at the picture of the car. And so I could kind of just zoom in and say, okay, you can actually see that there are six gears that uh, are there in this car. Uh, there is uh, 220 miles per hour that it can do. Uh, you can probably go and also see that it's got a fantastic sound system, uh, 1200 watt, cutting speaker, whatever, right? And these are just images that have been taken from the uh, car's brochure, uh, brochure uh, so scanned and kind of assembled together into this deep zoom uh, collection. So, not really. Uh, uh, something that you can build on your JPE applications as frontends or uh, real user experiences. So uh, that was about doing some interoperability and having uh, rich user experiences. Uh, one URL, just one URL for everything that uh, we've been talking about, Microsoft or Com search intro. If you want specifics on Civilite, you can go to Civilite.net. Uh, you, you can go to uh, OpenXML. OpenXML.org for uh, uh, any, anything specific on OpenXML and look at all the uh, things we published there. Uh, these are our contacts, so we're running out of time. So, any questions, any further things, if you have any of these scenarios in your current applications, feel free to get in touch with us. These are our email IDs, those are our blogs. Uh, you can easily get in touch with us. No one has taken PHP in this whole summer. We will show it to you in this book. <laughs> there are not too many. And, uh, uh, no, yeah, so. Not okay. Okay. Actually, PHP not not uh, not really. That's not the right. Right. Any further questions or anything?